Today, I'm in the studio talking with Tim Mann of Train the Brain, LLC. Tim shares his inspiring story of how discovering the Wim Hof method helped him make a complete recovery after a devastating accident that nearly claimed his life. After his accident, Tim was suffering from a traumatic brain injury, PTSD, emergent mood disorder, along with an addiction to painkillers. He credits his dedication to practicing breath work and cold water exposure in helping him gain his life back. Tim has since gone on to become a certified Wim Hof instructor who now trains others in the method. We'll talk about the scientific evidence of how you can influence your autonomic nervous system and how everyone can use these techniques to live a happier and healthier life. So without further ado, let's jump in. Thanks, Tim, for coming on This Artisan Life. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Awesome. So I got to spend the last two days attending Tim's workshops. The first day I went and filmed and the second day I actually got to participate. And so what a cool experience, not just from all that I learned, but also getting to meet all the different individuals there. I'm sure you've connected with a lot of people over the years, and that must be a really great part of why you keep doing this. Yeah, it's awesome. I got to meet a lot of great people and it's just good bringing people together and hearing about why they're there. Absolutely. Everyone's got a story to tell. Absolutely. So Tim was kind enough to come in the studio. It's bright and I can't even say bright because the sun's not up, but it is early Monday morning before he heads back home to his family and his day job because teaching the Wim Hof method is not all that you do. You actually work as a licensed counselor in the school system down in Chelsea, Michigan, I believe, right? That's right. Became a counselor in 2016. Worked in Detroit for a little while, then Jackson, and then got to Chelsea. I've been there for maybe four years now. So that's really great that you'd not only get to affect people with all your teaching now, but to get to work with children as well and kind of teach them some of the tools that you've learned through doing this over the years must be really satisfying. Yeah, it's nice. They complement each other really nice. Before you went on and you got your master's in counseling and became a licensed professional counselor and got into all this kind of line of work, you actually went to Northern Michigan University and studied outdoor rec. Is that Mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Bringing it back to when you first became interested or, dare I say, obsessed with the human nervous system, tell me a little bit about how that interest was first piqued. Mm. So after I graduated from Northern, I went to International Wilderness Leadership School. I was training to become a sea kayaking instructor and took a long trip down to Baja, California. There's um, two islands down there, Isla Espiritu Santo and Isla San Jose, and just spent a prolonged period of time just completely immersed in nature, kayaking around these islands. And, you know, I just started to notice that really cool things in nature would peak a stimulation within my body. It would give me goosebumps. Have you ever gotten goosebumps from listening to some good music? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that started happening a lot, whether I was looking up at the sky, the night sky, the Milky Way, there was no light pollution down there. So you could really see all the stars and that's a beautiful view, right? We don't, we don't really get that too often around here. You'd get a little bit more being in the UP, but downstate, we just don't get that. And so that was a, Quite an experience being able to look up at the night sky and see just billions of stars and even see the colors of the Milky Way galaxy poking out and it just make my hair stand up. And then seeing a whale breach kayaking up the coastline or these little ringtails, raccoon looking things that are trying to break in the kayaks at night trying to steal our avocados. <laughs> just little things like this would happen and make my hair stand up. And I started to notice that when I would breathe into that feeling, it would intensify. And so then I started to ask myself, do I really need that external circumstance to trigger that internal reaction. And at first I did, but then once I kept focusing on the area of the brainstem and breathing into it, I started to be able to do it without having some trigger from nature. And that was fascinating. Um, Kept practicing and practicing for the rest of the time I was down there. And before you know it, I was able to just make my hair stand up and get the stimulation going through my body. And it was really interesting. Um, And it's not that uncommon you know science hasn't really studied it that much but the more that i put this out there i'll have people reaching out to me saying oh i can do this too and so then i'm connecting with all these other people and got into a group on facebook called self-inducers it's all these (laughs) it's kind of cult-like it's kind of strange you got to take a video of yourself voluntarily generating pyloerection that's the fancy 
term for self-inducing goosebumps, right? Yeah. So it's basically goosebumps on demand. Yes. Yes. So you join the group on Facebook. Yeah. I joined this group on Facebook and it's hundreds of people all over the world that are doing this too. And so reached out to all these people and sent them a questionnaire just to kind of gather more info and learn more about their experience. And almost everybody's saying the same thing. Um, it starts in the brainstem, goes to the rest of the body, and they can do it whether they're lying down or sitting up, eyes closed, eyes open. doesn't really matter. It's just almost like a flick, just a switch in the brain where you just shift your awareness into the brainstem and breathe into it. And voila. Wow. Very cool. So as you discovered, it's not as uncommon. So you came to believe like, hey, it's definitely like a learned thing, something that anybody could potentially train themselves to do. I believe so. What was the term that we used? Interception? Oh, like, interoception. Interoception. Yeah. The ability to kind of feel and observe within. Yeah. The actual definition of it, I think, is just paying attention to inward bodily processes. Okay. So whether your heartbeat or your adrenals, whatever it may be, breathing. You were saying that um, the part of our brain that evolved kind of in modern day society really shut that off because now our awareness is focused more in the prefrontal cortex. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so you think about it, the brain stem is a reactionary part of the brain, old, old, deep, primitive, reptilian part of the brain. And that was dominant for hundreds of thousands of years. We were living more immersed in nature. And so we had more immediate threats in our environment. And so we were much more focused on the here and now. But since modern society, the comforts of modern society, we've become much more predictive, especially since the rise of the internet. Way more of our blood is being pumped into our cortex. So we're now way more cerebral beings. We're thinking about the past, thinking about the future. You know, it's... Also what causes a lot of anxiety. Yeah, that gives rise to a lot of mental health issues. You know, I'm just thinking all the time. So it's a good call for exercise, cold exposure, heat exposure, meditation, get back down into that deep part of the brain. Okay. So your initial interest in learning more about the nervous system came from learning about or discovering this talent that you had for voluntary Oh gosh, say say the say the technical term again because I'm always afraid I'm gonna screw it up. Voluntarily generated erection. Okay, which which is the goosebumps on demand. So, you said you became obsessed with it, like t telling all your friends. Yeah, no, it was really strange because it was just a really unique thing that I'd never experienced before. And once I started tapping into that, it kind of felt like a felt like a superpower at first. You know, it, you can really get your body stimulated and it feels really good and so i started doing it all the time and it just became you know almost like a drug you know you can just breathe right into there and get this great feeling going throughout your body and whenever i would talk about it with people most people would look at me like i was crazy and then so i had to really pick and choose who to talk about it with and be careful about what i said and then finally i got to a point where i just didn't care anymore i just we we'll just talk about it and people can think what they want, you know. At this time, you're uh, now working in the school systems outside of Detroit, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Detroit Cody High School. You had just started working there when one day you were on your way home from work. And tell our viewers what happened. It wasn't after work. I was at my cousin's on a weekend. He lives right outside of Detroit. And I was leaving his house um, early in the morning. It was like 4 a.m. I couldn't sleep. And so I ended up just driving home and uh, got a flat tire on 96 West and pulled over on the side of the highway. It's a dark stretch of highway. There was no lights on this part of the highway, but I remember pulling over, hitting my flashers, getting out, checking the tire, and it was just completely flat. And I was all, I was pretty upset at this time because it was cold night, dark, and I had to change this tire. It's like 4 a.m. So I got back in for whatever reason on the passenger side of the vehicle. Called my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, Samantha, because she knew I was not sleeping well and I was going to drive home. So I called her and said, hey, I'm going to be like another hour. I got to change this tire. And while I'm on the phone with her, smack, I got hit by a drunk driver. Police report says he was going 80 miles an hour. This sent me and my Jeep rolling down the side of the ditch. I did not have my seatbelt on. I was bouncing around like a pinball in that car. Snapped my left arm in half. And I had two rods in my left arm. Uh, fractured my right ankle, tore my medial meniscus, fractured five vertebrae, lacerated my liver, 
dislocated my jaw, smacked my head really good and fractured my skull in a couple places. And so now I'm lying in my car, trapped in there because my car is just sm all smushed up, right? Trapped in there. The guy who hit me came around to the passenger side and is tugging on me, trying to get me out of the car. He ends up taking off running because he was drunk and high. Third party stopped. I still don't know this guy's name. God bless him. And I'm pretty sure that he called the ambulance and paramedics get there. They use the jaws of life to pull the car open. They get me out of the vehicle on the stretcher. I'm having a seizure. They get me up into the ambulance. They roll me into the ICU at Beaumont where I'm having my second seizure. And they had to perform emergency brain surgery because I had all this intracranial hypertension. My head started to swell up like a balloon. So they drilled a hole in my head, alleviate that pressure. That ultimately saved my life. and also put me into a coma, self-induced coma for eight days. Um, after day four, they tried to pull the tube out because they thought I could breathe on my own, but I couldn't. So then they had to reinsert the tube and that kind of damaged some vocal cords and ended up getting pneumonia too during that time. After eight days, they pulled the tube and I could breathe again, but I couldn't move because I kept trying to pull the, like the IV out and all this stuff. So I was tied down to the bed and I, you know, my body's all broken. So I wasn't moving anyway. Shouldn't be moving at least. <laughs> yeah. So I was just stuck kind of lying there on the hospital bed for a couple of weeks, staring at the ceiling. And um, what gave me some some hope while I was in there is I noticed I could still hit that switch in my brain stem and kind of flood my body with endorphins. And that was even in the midst of, you know, being all jazzed up on fentanyl, which is supposed to cut, which does cut off the connection between your frontal cortex and your limbic system. And so that was just a nice little uh, glimmer of hope lying there just knowing that I could do something while I was while I was lying there in that bed and I'm able to move so lucky lucky to be alive yeah no doubt no doubt and that's like one of the biggest lessons um that I walk away with and it's such a blessing having lost my life like that now whenever some shit happens I can always think back to that moment hey, and be like, hey well at least you can move at least you have a body at least you can think at least you know gives you a nice reference point to be thankful. Absolutely. Wow. Very powerful. I think I heard you say too, you came to be eventually thankful for the incident because it led you on the path of where you are today. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It was a, it sounds strange saying it, but it was a really great reset. If I wouldn't have made a full recovery, who knows what I'd be feeling like, but you know, I'm blessed to have a really supportive family, a wonderful medical industry that was able to save my life and then coming across this Wim Hof method. Um, yeah, I'm just really lucky. Okay, so that leads me into my next point is how you really do credit the Wim Hof method with saving your life beyond the accident because that wasn't the only challenge, getting through the hospital and getting through all the injuries. What happened once you came home? Yeah, so I was discharged. I was diagnosed with uh, emergent mood disorder, which is common after a traumatic brain injury of that severity. And I had PTSD and I had a script of oxy. And so I got really addicted to the oxycodone and had no control over my mood because of the traumatic brain injury. And it was really hard to even think and find the words that I wanted to use. Uh, it was hard to, I had to like learn, relearn how to do a lot of things like speak and think and um, urinate again. You know, I was using a catheter for a long time. Uh, walking again was a challenge because I had fractured these five vertebrae. So I had to just really relearn how to do a lot of things. Got discharged, got back home. I'm in rough shape, no control over my mood, just up and down, up and down all day, every day. And one day I you know, hobbled over to the couch. I got my neck brace on and my arm sling and my boot and walk over to the couch and put on the Joe Rogan podcast. He had this guy named Wim Hof on there. And I should say, too, when I got home from my trip from Mexico, when I had learned all about voluntarily generated erection, I got home and I looked that up on the Internet, and there was very little science on it, just three individual case studies. And so I couldn't find anything about voluntarily influencing the autonomic nervous system for 10 years or so. I'd read Eastern literature Guys like Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and Hazrat Inyat Khan and Gopi Krishna, these guys were talking about it. I'm certain that's what they're talking about. It was VGP. 
And so when I put on that Joe Rogan podcast, he had Wim Hof on. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll listen to Wim Hof. And one of the first things Wim says in that podcast is, I have scientific evidence that we can voluntarily influence our autonomic nervous system. And that's what I've been obsessed with for 10 years. And so when he said that, I was captivated and very interested. So I watched the rest of the podcast and I couldn't take a cold shower at that time, nor did I want to, but I could breathe. And so I started doing rounds upon rounds upon rounds of Wim's breath work every day. And within a matter of a week or two, it's hard to remember exactly how much time. I want to say a couple weeks of doing that breath work every day. I balanced out my mood and literally rewired my nervous system to where I wasn't having nearly as many nightmares. I would wake up a lot in the middle of the night and feel like 96 and 94 were like intersecting right through my bedroom. And so I'd wake up in a panic a lot and that started to fade away. My gain control of my mood and just had a, a will to really live again and to get off the oxy. I stopped taking that stuff pretty shortly after I started doing the breath work and just really, um, yeah, it really saved my life in a way. Let's tell people who may not be familiar with the Wim Hof Method what the three pillars are. Uh, yeah. So Wim Hof Method is a combination of a growth mindset, breath work, and cold water immersion. And when you combine those three things together, it really helps you create an even stronger, happier, and healthier life. So you're practicing this breath work and the other pillars, you know, with mindset and cold water exposure, you start to realize that the cold water exposure is really about the ability to train yourself to do hard things and to kind of overcome that mental challenge component. And I think we talked a little bit about the part of your brain, the anterior mid-singular cortex, the part of your brain that actually grows when you do hard things. So at this point, you're like, I have to incorporate this into my routine. So you start driving to your parents' house and getting in the lake in the wintertime. Is this correct? Yeah. So I didn't want to start taking cold showers at first, but once the gear came off, the neck brace, I started showering again. I started turning that water down cold. And I noticed I made my hair stand up. It's one of the first things it does is it gives you goosebumps. So I was fascinated by that. And that really hooked me in. I was like, okay, I got to keep doing this more. So then I started driving out to my parents' house and cutting a hole in the ice and hopping in there. They thought I was crazy. They're like, don't do this. It's the middle of winter. You're going to die. And, you know, it was some convincing. I just kept going and and doing it. And over the course of, I don't know, maybe a couple months of doing it every day, a lot of the residual pain in my spine and my brain started to dwindle away, stopped getting headaches, uh, knee really started feeling better, ankle started feeling better, got back exercising and really making the most out of life. It made such a profound difference in your life. When did you decide to go and get certified to share this training with others? I mean, even after all that, it's an expensive certification. And then plus you got to pay for your airfare to get over there and go through the training. So at first, you know, it did wonders for me, but I still wasn't ready to go become an instructor for whatever reason. Um, I still had my counseling license and wanted to get back into counseling. So I started making steps towards that. But then my daughter, Adeline, was diagnosed with a really rare genetic disorder called Pompe disease. And there's some evidence that shows that cold water immersion might help break down glycogen on a lysomal level, which is what she might need help with. And so once I kind of started reading about that, um, that is really what pushed me over the edge and was just like, you know what, you got to look out for other people and you got to go get certified and and then share this with the world. So then I went over to Poland and got certified and came on back and started running workshops. Yeah, right on. When you went to Poland, did you actually, is that when you met Wim? Never met him. He wasn't there that week. He was filming Freeze the Fear with BBC. So I didn't get to learn from Wim, but I got to learn from a guy named Matt Soul. If you ever get the chance to meet Matt Soul. You should check him out. He's a brilliant instructor. How many people were at this certification with you? 75 instructors all over the world. And they probably had, oh, I don't know, five to 10, call them level three instructors who have been doing it for a long time and trained the trainer. So at this time of our filming, you are currently the only certified Wim Hof Method trainer in the state of Michigan. Is that correct? Yeah, there was another guy for a minute, but he just recently moved to Milwaukee. You know, shout out to Brian McCarroll. Good dude. So your daughter isn't the only person in your life that has some difficulties 
that you were thinking this might be helpful for. Tell me a little bit about your father. So my dad's got multiple sclerosis. It's an autoimmune disorder. He's had it for as long as I can remember. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that this breath work is beneficial for people with autoimmune disorders. And so I was thinking about my dad quite a bit too. Um, that guy's been an absolute blessing to have in my life. And I figured um, might as well start showing him this breath work and get him practicing. So he did start practicing and doing the breath work and doing his cold showers and he's feeling good. One of the cool things about the breath work is that it releases a cell messaging protein called interleukin 10. And my dad was taking injections for over 30 years for his multiple sclerosis to boost his interleukin 10. So I'm not recommending anything for anybody. I'm not a doctor, but you know, I know that the breath work can help with autoimmune disorders and it might help you boost that interleukin 10 to where you might not need something outside of yourself to get that boost to that cell messaging protein. That's amazing. Because so much right now is really focused on pharmaceutical cures. And like you were saying, when you started researching back into Eastern medicine, it, it was a lot more common to use that mind-body connection and what you have within to really help yourself through a lot of these ailments. And now it's just not the norm. Yeah, it's really not. But we all have this internal medicine cabinet, and we can tap into that. The brain is the most sophisticated pharmaceutical center on the planet. And sitting here with you today, I could never have guessed that you went through what you went through just a seven short years ago. Your accident was in 2017. Mm -hmm. Since then, you've been practicing this pretty consistently? Every day. Every day? Every day. So you came here and met me at 6.15 a.m. Did you get in the lake this morning? I did at 5 a.m. I got up and got in that lake. It's beautiful. Uh, there was an owl out there hooting, and the moon was nice and bright. It's just, yeah, it's really beautiful. Man, dude, you do that every day? Every day. Something for me to aspire to. Tell me a little bit about how you use the practice in your daily life and what that does for you. First thing when I wake up, I hop in that cold water, and it is like drinking... 10 cups of coffee without the jitters. You know, you get you get jazzed up. You're awake, alive, ready to go. Your mood and energy gets sent through the roof and it lasts for hours and hours and hours. So just the way that I really like to start my day, some breath work and some cold water immersion. Also, when you get done with your day and you're feeling that little bit of crash and you still got to come home and be the family man, you jump in that tank. Yeah, I got a trough right on my back deck. And in the wintertime, it's nice because you don't have to put ice in there. Summertime is a little bit different, but in the wintertime, that water is cold. And so I'll get home from work and be feeling a little groggy and tired. But if I just hop in that thing for two minutes quick, hop out, I'm back feeling awake and alive and full of energy and dancing and singing, making dinner in the kitchen, you know? Have you convinced your wife to start doing this yet? Oh yeah, she does it. Yep. Yeah. She stopped for a while when she was pregnant, right? Because we don't know what type of effect these long breath holds have on a developing fetus. And so she stopped doing the breath work while she was pregnant and the cold water immersion she wasn't doing while she was pregnant either. But she's been into it. She's been doing it. That's awesome. Can you explain a little bit about how the breath work is connected with the cold water immersion? So obviously there's a protocol and I'm not sure exactly what the um, routine of breath work is. So can you just explain that for us quick? Yeah, it's nice to do the breath work before you go out in the water because you get more adrenaline doing this breath work than somebody who's actually bungee jumping for the first time. So you get a ton of endorphins and that gives you energy and um, makes the cold water, it doesn't make it easy, but it makes it easier after you do the breath work. The breathing routine is what? Can you just explain that real quick? Yeah, we'll start with 30 deep breaths, filling up your belly first, then your chest, going into a breath hold, after that breath hold, you take a nice full inhale in, fill up the belly and the chest, hold it for 15 seconds, let it go. That's one round. You do about three to four rounds in a row. Okay. And you said you can actually do as many rounds. You can really lean into it and do several more, but it kind of takes you to a very interesting place. Yeah, definitely do an alternative state of consciousness, no doubt. If you do five to 10 rounds, you can get there with just three rounds, but if you keep going and you do 10 rounds, yeah, it gets really interesting down there. So tell me a little bit about DMT. Uh, dimethyltryptamine is a psychedelic compound. It's found in a lot of things, uh, a lot of plants, a lot of mammals, 
every mammal that they've looked for it and they've found it. There's a study done in 2019 at University of Michigan, Kim Jaborgan and John Dean found that it's endogenously produced in humans. It's a neurotransmitter. They found it in the, all throughout the brain, throughout the cortex, the pineal gland, the lungs, the liver. It's all throughout our bodies. And it's at the same level as dopamine and serotonin, which are really important neurotransmitters that we know a ton about in neuroscience. But we don't know much about DMT. But it's doing something, and it's there. So the breath work can actually trigger your body to naturally release this DMT. And what are the effects that you feel when this happens? You know, I don't know how much of it is because of the DMT release. You know, we don't really know ex exactly how much DMT it stimulates. It's just a hypothesis right now. I'd be really interested to see if there's any research being done on that. Maybe somebody will reach out to me after listening to this podcast and say, hey, check this out. Um but when you do the breath work, you know, you feel high. You get all these endorphins, and we like to call it getting high on your own supply. So the breath work, what it really does, from my understanding, and maybe you can correct me if I'm not getting this exactly right, but you're alternating between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So tell me a little bit about those two parts of your nervous system and what that means to alternate between them through doing this breath work. So you got two branches of your autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. And if you're in a high pressure job, or even if you're not, some people spend a lot of their day in fight or flight mode and they have a hard time getting back into that parasympathetic and relaxing. So when you do this breath work, you're going 30 to 40 deep breaths and you're really activating that sympathetic part. And then you go into that breath hold and you activate the parasympathetic part. So you're going back and forth between those two branches of the nervous system. And it's like an exercise for your autonomic nervous system. You're able to switch back and forth easily. And that transfers over into other domains of your life. So when you're getting really stressed out at work, if you've been practicing this breath through work, you'll be able to calm down more effectively and quicker when you need to. That makes sense. So it's just like any other muscle. The more you use it, the more you exercise it, the more your body can naturally access that ability. Mm -hmm. And so it's a huge stress reliever, not just when you're doing the breath work, but throughout the rest of your day and, and the rest of your life, really. Yeah, absolutely. And same, the cold water immersion does that same thing. You know, you start to learn how to master the stress response. Exercise does that same thing. When you push yourself running or lifting, it transfers over to other areas. You can handle stress more effectively. Okay. So the combination of the breath work, exercising, the switching between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, there is a very similar thing that happens when you get into the cold water that exercises your vascular system. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So you got 80,000 miles of veins, arteries, and capillaries running through your body. If you actually unraveled that, it'll wrap around the earth two and a half times. That's how much of the, that cardiovascular network you have inside you, which is pretty amazing if you actually think about that. It's a lot of cardiovascular network. When you get into that cold water, you get vasoconstriction. That just means that those veins and arteries narrow and tighten. Then when you get out and you start exercising, you get vasodilation and they open up. You got all these little muscles that lace your cardiovascular network. So they get an exercise when you do cold water immersion. And what happens after that? If you do that consistently, your heart actually starts to beat less because the rest of your cardiovascular network is stronger. So you can drop your resting heart rate pretty significantly by consistently getting in some cold water. And this is really nothing new if you look at Finnish culture and the sauna, because in the UP we say it correctly, sauna. You look at taking a sauna, and the new study that came out about just four saunas a week increases your, decreases your mortality rate by something like 40%. I, I'm not even sure if I'm getting that right, so don't, don't um, quote me on that. But the same concept, it is this vascular exercise of going from either extreme heat or extreme cold um, back and forth that allows your vascular system to become more robust. Yeah. Yeah, and you can just do it with exercise, so you don't have to get in a sauna. I don't know if I said that right. Yeah, so sauna is great. Don't get me wrong, but you don't actually need it um, to get a workout for your cardiovascular system. You can just exercise and get vasodilation and warm yourself back up. And that has, you know, 
more benefits doing it that way too with um you know increasing metabolism and changing white fat into brown fat you got two different types of fat on your body white fat and brown fat brown fat produces heat white fat's that fat that's kind of hard to get rid of but if you consistently cold plunge it's been shown that you can change that white fat into brown fat and your body can then be more efficient at producing heat and warming itself back up. How, how often do people have to practice this to really get the effects? Susanna Soberg, she's got a great book, Winter Swimming. She recommends 11 minutes per week to start getting that boost in metabolism. But you can't run to a sauna. You got to warm yourself back up naturally through exercise. Okay, so I'm going to make a little confession here. When I came out yesterday and jumped in Johnson Lake, that was the first time I've actually warmed up naturally on my own. I did not know that component. And so if you're listening out there and you have been curious or maybe like dabbling in cold water exposure or maybe taking cold showers, the whole point is not to take the cold shower and then quick, turn it back on warm and warm yourself up to get the real benefit. Fits. Tell me more about it's it's about using your body's ability to warm itself. Yeah, absolutely. So you can still get benefits if you just get in the cold water and then you go back to being inside and getting warm. That's okay. You'd still benefits in that. But if you want the most benefits, spend a little more time outside, do some body weight squats or what Wim likes to do, the horse stance, and um, warm yourself back up naturally and you get even more benefits. That, yeah, that was new to me. I didn't realize that. And I got some great video of everyone out on the ice doing their horse dance like pose. And I, I did it too. And it's actually surprising how quickly your body does warm back up. And the first day of the workshop Saturday, it was a beautiful day in the UP. So surprising for the beginning of March, we had 50 degree temps and the sun was shining. And honestly, it kind of felt like a normal UP <laughs> summer day because, you know, the lake doesn't usually warm up too much. But uh, the next day, when I went in the water, man, it was a bit colder. It was in the 40s and the wind was really whipping. And I'm not going to lie, I was intimidated. I was a little bit nervous. And that lake water is colder than the, it felt colder than the water that's in the trough I have in my garage. Um, but getting out, once you dry off, it was surprising just by doing some of those squats. I, I started to feel real good. And I'm sure that was the endorphins kicking in as well. Um, but also just the power of doing it with a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome doing it with a group. And also what happens too when you start exercising after you get out of cold water is your testosterone goes up and that's going to help with confidence and have you feeling good as well. Oh, that's what's going on. Okay. It's another, yeah, another little benefit there. <laughs> right on. That's so cool. Um, so many effects, some of which we don't even understand, but I will say if you try it and experience it for yourself, there is nothing like it. Yep, yep. Put yourself through hell each morning and you got a much better chance of experience in heaven the rest of the day. I love that. And there's a lot of science that shows why that is too. You know, if you get in cold water for just one to two minutes, 59 degrees Fahrenheit or below, noradrenaline goes up over 500%. A lot of antidepressants on the market will target noradrenaline receptors in the brain. So it's a fantastic natural mood enhancer. And also dopamine goes up over 250%. So that's has to do with pleasure, but also energy and motivation. So yeah, mood and energy through the roof, two minutes of suffering, but then you get benefits for eight hours. And plus you get the compounded benefits of getting that workout for your cardiovascular system. And one of the biggest killers of people all over the world is cardiovascular related diseases. So I want to talk a little bit about Wim, just because yeah. Wim is very charismatic. Anyone who uh, knows him, he has an energy. I don't know if charismatic would be the word as much as he has an energy about him that people gravitate towards because he's a very interesting character. You've gotten to meet him? Haven't met him in person. I've Zoomed with him a few times and FaceTime with him now on the on WhatsApp, but um, never met him in person before. But ever since I started doing research with Wayne State University, after that study was published, we really got connected. And now we talk quite a bit. It's been pretty cool having him just send me random photos of what he's doing and, and calling and just wanting to talk. He's just a really good dude who cares about people. Uh, he's got a heart of gold. Tell me a little bit about some of Wim's uh, accomplishments. At one point, he had 26 Guinness World Records. He swam the length of a football field under the ice where his retina actually froze halfway through. And then, so now he's blind, swimming in freezing cold water. I think he goes past 
the hole, so he missed it, and then his intuition kicked on saying, hey, you went too far, so then he swam back. So he probably swam more than the length of a football field, right? Um, he's ran a marathon in the desert without water. He's ran, I think it's a half marathon in the Arctic Circle, barefoot in his swimsuit. He does everything in his swimsuit, right? Um, he hiked up Mount Everest in a bathing suit. It's pretty wild. Now, we have to kind of make some clarification here. He's not just this crazy superhuman. Well, maybe he kind of is. <laughs> but there's a method to his madness. He's not just going out and doing these things. This is an ability that he has trained his body to do through breath work. Mm -hmm. For a long time, for years and years and years, voluntarily going out in the cold. And if you do that, your body adapts. The body is meant to get stronger under stress. And so your body can do really incredible things if you're willing to challenge it. So the ability for your mind to even influence your immune system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this breath work, they've done, they did a study. Wim was making all these claims saying that he doesn't get sick. And so Radbound University had him come over and they injected him with E. coli, an endotoxin. Like a dead shell of bacteria makes 100 out of 100 people sick. Cold sweats, fevers, headaches, maybe even diarrhea. Like you get really sick when you get E. coli. He gets that injected into him, does the breath work that you practiced the other day, and has no symptoms. And so these doctors said, oh, well, you must have special genetics. He said, no, no, I don't. Anybody can do this. And they ended up applying for a grant through the Dutch government, I believe. They got it. Wim trained 12 guys in the method. Mindset, breathwork, cold water immersion. Just four days out in Poland. Those 12 guys came back to Radboud University, all got shot up with that same endotoxin, practiced the breathwork. All 12 of those guys, no symptoms. All 18 guys in the control group all got sick. So it just goes to show this breathwork really has some power. It was for the first time in medical history, it's been proven that we can voluntarily influence our autonomic nervous system and directly influence our innate immune response. Wow. Powerful. Really powerful, right? So the ability to use this breath work to help heal your body. Heck yeah. Yeah, and it's free. You just got to know how to do it. And then you can take that skill and use it for the rest of your life. So th that leads me into kind of what I want to talk about next, learning how to do these skills. So it's really important to note that people that are interested in this, it's beneficial to come and learn because there's also a safety component to this. Mm -hmm, no doubt. Yeah, you definitely want to be safe practicing. Shit can happen, right? So you always want slow, small, gradual changes. You don't want to just go start jumping into freezing cold water your first time. You, know, you want to start with cold showers, maybe start with a minute or two. You can always bump the time up a little bit and keep turning the water cold each day that you go. But yeah, slow, small, gradual changes. And then if you are going to cut a hole out in the ice in a lake or a river or wherever, make sure that you had a buddy with you. Make sure you bring a rope. Make sure that the if you cut a hole in the river, make sure that that current isn't too strong because if you jump in that hole and that current's strong, it takes you under. See you later. Um. Which has happened. Which has happened. Yeah, yeah. It's really sad. So you really want to be careful when you practice. Easy entry, easy exit. Because when you get in cold water for a few minutes, you get vasoconstriction going through your body. Your hands and your feet are the first to shut down because your body is really smart. It will reserve your vital organs. So you get vasodilation in your core, but the rest of your body starts to go numb. And so you don't have the same dexterity in your hands and fingers. So if you... You just want to really make sure that you have an easy entry and an easy exit out of that cold water. So when you see people on Facebook that maybe are inexperienced and, hey, you know, it's no big deal. We're going to go and jump in the lake. Really thinking about safety first and not being stupid enough to climb out on an ice shelf, being mindful of the fact that stuff can happen and things do happen. So really thinking about that safety component. Absolutely. Very important. And the other part of that is not doing the breath work in the water itself. 100%. Yeah, so you can pass out when you do this breath work. If you push yourself too hard, you're not listening to your body during those 30 to 40 deep breaths, you might start to get a little lightheaded. And some people who go too far and push it will pass out. And so you can imagine you don't want to be doing that in the water. You don't want to pass out in the water. So there's other breath work we teach for in the water. I understand that you're a part of a new study at Wayne State University. Is this correct? Can you tell me a little bit about this? Yeah. So Wim came to Wayne State in 2018, I think it was, and 
this study, it's known as the brain over body study. And if you get on YouTube and you just type in Wim Hof brain over body, you can watch a really cool educational video on that. It's about five minutes long. That'd be a really good explanation. The guy's explaining it way better than I ever could. I'll actually link to that below oh, in nice. the show notes. Yeah. So um, I reached out to these auto music, the head of neurology at Wayne State University as I was becoming certified and just said, you know, any if you're doing any more science on this, let me know. I'd love to be a part of it. And he got right back to me and said, we've been looking for an instructor. Would you want to help us out with this study? I said, yeah, absolutely. So I got to train five guys in the Wim Hof method. It was a six or eight week intervention. Can't remember exactly, but we would meet every Sunday and hop in the ice bath together, do the breath work, and got them through that. And then the other six days out of the week, they were doing the breath work each day and doing a cold shower. And then what they did is they were measuring brain activity. So they did PET scans and MRIs before the intervention and after the intervention. And just found a lot of cool things. It was a pilot study, small group, but with these guys, we found that a combination of controlled stressors and mindfulness alleviates stress and anxiety. We found that controlled stressors promote mental focus through improved interoception. Mindful interoceptive attention increases CB1R binding and cognitive networks, and that behavioral interve interventions can improve cognitive control of the stress response. So it's really just cool findings. Um, we can't generalize that to the bigger population yet, but now we're working on a new study. Those doctors are writing the grant. Hopefully they get it. Um, I think it's for $2 million. It's going to be a five-year study where we're going to look at 100 people, men and women, variety of ages, and do the almost the same study again. Wow. Do I understand it's a goal of yours to really be able to incorporate this into mental health care, especially for children? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, It'd be awesome if we could get it with kids. Right now, it's just approved for 18 and up. But it would it is a goal of mine to get this method approved as actual mental health modality. Well, beyond just the Wim Hof method, you and I both know as parents to young children that just teaching them to be mindful of their breath when they're experiencing anxiety can really help them through this. I know this is something that I've taught my younger one, and you have some experience in this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love I love teaching my daughter the breath work. I'll be doing it on the couch often, and then I'll I'll come back to you know open my eyes and and look over, and she'll just be like staring at me just like this far. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty awesome. But then yeah, if she's ever having a hard time, you know, I've been teaching her how to take nice deep breaths with really long, slow exhales, and that's what you want to do if you really want to relax. Longer exhale helps activate your parasympathetic nervous system. And so that's a really good tool that anybody can use at any time throughout their day because you're always breathing. <clears throat> as long as you're alive, you're breathing. And so that's a good tool you can use. Um, what's that quote? It's uh, We can go weeks without food, days without water, but you can only go minutes without breathing. So that's how fundamental and important breathing is, but it's an autonomic function. You know, you don't have to pay attention to it. You naturally do it. But when you do take the time and pay attention to it, there's really a lot of power in it, but it goes unnoticed a lot. Breathing mindfully. Yeah. Yeah. Low, slow through the nose. Yep. There's a fantastic book by James Nestor called Breath. Mm -hmm. For anyone who hasn't read it, I highly recommend it. I devoured that book in a matter of a couple of days. And my husband and I are kind of crazy. We really enjoyed this book. We uh, started taping our mouths at night. I know everyone <laughs> saw the kind of... <laughs> crazy social media trend that went went on a few years ago where everyone was taping their mouth. But our personal experience has been my husband snores. Um, and when he tapes his mouth, he does not and he feels more well rested after um, sleeping and being forced to breathe through his nose at night. And so in the book in James Nestor's book, he talks about the science behind um, a lot of things are connected with the way we breathe. It's not just anxiety, but it really goes back to bone structure. Um, it's a fascinating book. And for anyone who hasn't read it, I just highly recommend it. So that's my one plug on that. Yeah, I also I support that. Go out, read that book. It's fascinating. But really makes you think about 
breathing throughout the day because, like you said, it's something that you do automatically and you don't even realize there are ways of breathing that can trigger anxiety or make anxiety worse. Mm -hmm. And there's ways that can help calm that. Yeah, so there's a direct correlation with breathing and anxiety. A lot of people have panic attacks. If you watch them, they'll be breathing through their chest, a lot of times through their mouth. So really quickly try to get them breathing through their nose, breathing slower, getting that oxygen down deep into their belly. Another thing that you've recognized as well is Eastern culture has long studied the effects of breath work on our mental health. Yeah, so one of the best definitions of life in general I've come across is that life is the lively coexistence of extreme opposites that orchestrate diversity into wholeness. And so what does that mean? It means you got left, you got right, you got up, you got down, front, back, you got space, then you got form, you got being comfortable, being uncomfortable, you got all these opposites. But there's always middle ground in those opposites. So if you picture the yin-yang symbol, you got dark on the left, light on the right. You got no matter how dark a situation is, there's always a little pocket of light in there. And no matter how good a situation is, there's always a little pocket of bad in there. Oh, what's that other quote? The brightest lights shine in the darkest places. Um, I don't know why I threw that in there. I just like that quote. But anyway, there's this guy, um, Vygotsky. He was a neuroscientist. He came up with the zone of proximal development. He had the left hemisphere of the brain and the right hemisphere of the brain. And the left hemisphere of the brain you can think of as mathematics and order. And the right side of the brain you can think of art or chaos being creative. And when you consistently bounce back and forth between the hemispheres, you enter into the zone of proximal development. That's where learning takes place when you go from what you know to what you don't know and you do that consistently. That's how you learn. It's the forming of neural connections, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Wiring wiring your brain. And that's what getting in cold water does. You know, you you go in there and you get cold, it's uncomfortable, but then you get comfortable in that uncomfortable and you work out that zone of proximal development. You relax in the middle of all that stress. Same thing with the breath work. The breath work is an acute stressor, does the same thing. Exercise does the same thing. You're dancing that line of order and chaos and learning and growing. Something that everyone can apply to every part of their life. No doubt. Tell me a little bit about the Oxygen Advantage and the training that you do with that because you've got um, your company, Train the Brain. Then you're also a certified peak performance coach as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. That's just a title I, I call myself, peak performance coach. But I recently got an Oxygen Advantage uh, certification, and that is really based more towards sport performance. There's a lot of different breath holding exercises that you can do to improve your endurance and your mind state. So you work with athletes. Yeah, I'm starting to break more and more into that world. That's really where I want to go with this. Shout out to Daryl Bauer, my buddy, the strength coach with university. He was at University of Houston uh, football program. Went down there this summer and trained those guys for a few days. I've worked with University of Michigan club soccer team. Worked with University of Detroit Mercy women's basketball program. Yeah, so I'm starting to break more into the, the world of college athletics. And that's been a lot of fun working with athletes. Tim, you are a busy man. How do you find time to do all of this? I don't know. I got to get home and see my girls. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You're you're excited to get home and see them. Well, I really appreciate your time here today. It's been fascinating to get to know you. Your story is extremely inspiring, and I know it'll help a lot of people. If people want to learn more, can you direct them where they can go to kind of find out more information on your workshops? Yeah, you go to trainthebrainllc.com. It's a website, um, the handle on the gram is Train the Brain LLC, Train the Brain LLC on Facebook. And I'll go ahead and link all of those below so you can follow Tim on social media. Do you have any more workshops scheduled right now? Yeah, I got one next weekend in Ludington on Saturday, and then March 23rd in Detroit at Ramp Athletics. Another one, I think it's April in April over at um, Spring Lake. It's on Lake Michigan at Chiropractic Center. That's fantastic. And you've done several workshops up in the UP, and I'm sure you'll keep doing those. We really appreciate you coming up here and training us youpers in this method. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Shout out to Randy and Libby Buchler and Tay and Hale, the whole family. I've ran almost, I don't know what number we're at. We're on almost 20 workshops up there at Shady Grove Farm UP. And those people are just absolutely amazing people, so supportive. 
And it's just the best place to run workshops. You got Johnson Lake right there, natural cold water immersion. They got a sauna on site. They open up their home and it just gives a completely different feel when you're in somebody's home. It's much easier to open up and relax and just be more a part of the group. That's what I've noticed from my experience. But yeah, those are just awesome workshops. And if you're in the UP and you're looking for something, you should check one of those out. Thank you so much, Tim. I greatly appreciate you coming on, and I look forward to all the fantastic things that you are going to do in the future. Thanks, Michelle, and thank you so much for taking me up on this and, and yeah, inviting me to your podcast studio and coming to the workshops and, and doing it. Awesome. Thank well, you. Well, thank you.